I spent the last 100 hours rereading the entirety of the Wano Country arc, breaking down everything in five parts to settle the debate once and for all if it was godly writing or a complete disaster. Starting with part number one, the setting. The first thing that stands out is the design of the country of Wano itself. Seeing Wano's ruined yet beautiful landscape again with fresh eyes was a real sight to behold. After four years, the chapters where Luffy first set foot on Wano's soil were like distant memories, and there was a ton of new meaning in these early chapters that can be gained with the benefit of hindsight now. Just like how most locations in the One Piece world take inspiration from real life places, there's no exception here, and you can tell how excited Oda was to draw his take on Edo period Japan. He revealed that his drawing of the flower capital is one of his favorite panels in the entire series to date. We also learned that Wano consists of several different regions, each with their own daimyos as well as their own climates, Kuri, Udon, Ringo, and the flower capital. Now all of these are separate islands joined together by bridges, and while we don't get to explore all of them fully, what we do see is exceptionally detailed. Wano is absolutely brimming with culture, customs, and characters. Just like its real-life counterpart in Edo period Japan, Wano is an isolationist country. Its culture was allowed to develop without much intervention from the outside world, at least until Kaido and Orochi came to power. Whereas many other countries in the One Piece world interact with each other through events like the Reverie or trading, Wano has closed its borders to the outside world completely. And at the introduction of the arc, we also learned that its borders are closed in a very literal way when we see that its landmass has risen high above the sea's surface. The crew has to ascend a massive waterfall in order to even get to Wano in the first place. And once they do, they find an expansive freshwater sea set high above the Grand Line. Now, when we first encounter Wano through Luffy's eyes, we see a wasteland. We've known since Punk Hazard and Dressrosa that Kaido was supplying weapons and arms to the black markets. But once we see a countryside littered with smokestacks, devoid of food, and polluted with toxic streams, we see just how dire the situation truly is. Kaido's influence has turned this place into a true wasteland. Wano has become a land of extreme inequality. Commoners like the girl Otama, the first ally that Luffy ever meets in Wano, starve and thirst. They have nothing. Soon, within the wastes of Kuri, we find Okobore Town, literally the leftovers town, because the residents there subsist off of the scraps remaining from neighboring Bakura Town, a home for Orochi's allies and officials in Kuri. But even more lavish than Bakura Town is the flower capital, Orochi base of operations. We see the children of the city being indoctrinated in schoolrooms, being taught supposed evils of the Kazuki clan, and lifting up Orochi as a hero. And in the city we see many symbols of feudal Japan, glamorous oirans parade through the streets. As a result, the Straw Hats work undercover as everything from ronin to soba noodle merchants. Now through Odin's flashback we get to see the unspoiled Wano of 20 years ago. While it wasn't a perfect place, its natural beauty flourished. And Odin helped to make it an even better place. He turned Kuri from a lawless land into a prosperous region. It makes it all the more painful then when we flash back forward to the raid on Onigashima, where we not only see Odin's inherited will, but we recognize the land, the home, that Kinemon and the rest of the Nine Scabbards are fighting for. Now when we look to the coast, in the distance there looms an ominous skull, Onigashima. It's a constant reminder of Kaido's influence on Wano. The beast is always there, always watching, ready to inflict further terrors upon the mainland. And Onigashima is also a great reminder of another feature of Wano settings, its ties to Japanese mythology. Primarily, the most heavily featured folk tales referenced throughout the Wano arc is that of Momotaro. The story of Momotaro, the Peach Boy, features a young boy traveling to Oni Island to combat an Oni, a terrible monster from Japanese mythology, with the aid of a monkey, a dog, and a pheasant, and he befriends these animal companions by feeding them Kibi Dango dumplings. And the connections to One Piece are obvious. They have Momotaro, but we have Momonosuke, who leads Wano with the aid of Monkey D. Luffy, Yamato, who zone transforms them into a dog, and the bird is most likely Marco, who turns into a phoenix. Other myths that are referenced are the multitude of yokai that appear when Big Mom makes new homies during the raid on Onigashima. The character Black Maria is based on a yokai called the Jorogumon a spider creature that takes the form of a beautiful woman. Her weapon, Wanyudo, is based on a yokai called 
fittingly, one Yudo, a large head encased in a flaming wheel. Another myth that's referenced comes at the very beginning of the arc with the carp ascending the waterfall. Because it's said that a carp that reaches the top of a waterfall will become a dragon. Think magic carp. And so that same myth is subtly referenced when we learn that Kaido's dragon fruit is actually a model of the fish fish fruit. Now throughout the entire arc, Wano is filled to the brim with references to history and mythology of Japan. However, for all the things that we got in this arc, there are still mysteries surrounding Wano country. For instance, at the end of the arc, Kozuki Sukiyaki reveals the remnants of an older Wano deep beneath the freshwater sea. And hidden beneath the country itself is the ancient weapon Pluton. We're also left wondering how the continent of Wano formed in the first place. How were the distinct islands brought together? Does it have something to do with the continent polar ores? And could the skull that makes up Onigashima be a relative of his? Leave it to Oda to always have us searching for more answers. It's clear though that even though we were in Wano for longer than any other island, we'll be seeing it again before the series is over. So I think it's clear that Wano from a world building perspective is probably one of the most beautiful things that Oda has ever created. But there are four more points to break down before we can actually cast our final verdict on this arc. And one is about the most controversial things about Wano that almost ruins the manga. So let's talk about part two, the characters. With our setting now established, it's time to get into some of the amazing new characters that we meet in Wano, as well as some of the familiar faces that we now got to know better and then had fantastic character arcs. And boy, were there a lot of characters, some silly, some tragic, and many, many that we'll never forget. Now, rereading the entire story and seeing the familiar faces again was like meeting up with long lost friends. Some of whom you meet with joy and some of whom you can never see the same way again. For example, on my second journey through Wano, how could I see Yasuie without thinking forward to his tragic ending? How could I see Kanjuro as part of the scabbards without gritting my teeth at his eventual betrayal? Oda has written some of the most lovable and endearing characters to date in this arc and it was a true pleasure rereading them. But again, this is probably the most controversial arc in One Piece, and I can't help but think that Oda made some baffling choices with his characters as well. And even though I trust in Oda's godly writing abilities for the future of the story, I still question some of the turns that these characters took. First of all, we have a massive supporting cast, background characters that didn't play a major role in the arc, but that added a lot of flavor to Wano. We have regular citizens like those of the Flower Capital, the Oirens, Yakuza, and the townspeople People celebrating the fire festival. There are the tragic citizens of Ebisu town cursed to laugh forever. We even have a small cameo from Minatomo, the carpenter who's a relative of but not the same Minatomo who was an SPS gag who fixed a door off screen in an early panel of Party's Bar. We have colorful combatants like Orochi's Oniwabanshu ninjas, there are the giant numbers, the pleasurers and best of all the gifters, a foddery enemy class made exclusively so that Oda could design the most most cursed looking animal human hybrids possible. Most of the supernovas also make an appearance here in Wano as well. We have Basil Hawkins finally taking on an important story role early on in the arc as one of Kaido's headliners. Very literal here because of the lines on his head. Somebody call Yugi Moto because this member of the worst generation believed in the heart of the cards right to the very end. Unlike Kit, whose alliance he betrayed to join Kaido, he didn't have a strong enough will of his own. Instead, he served who he perceived to be the strongest, both for his own advancement and for his own survival mostly. Scratchman Apu was another notable underling of Kaido here, though he didn't play into the arc as significantly as Hawkins, I would say. While he did absolutely show off his mad DJ skills and in the anime introduced us to the number one club banger of the year, he just couldn't stack up to his peers when it came in time for combat. Now, while Hawkins and the Pooh went where they saw themselves as most likely to survive, breaking under the superior strength of Kaido, X Drake had a completely different approach. Learning that he was secretly still a marine and undercover with a secret sect called Sword was a huge revelation that birthed tons of new fan theories and online speculation. And in the end, we got to see Sword go against Chi 
shield or CP Aegis Zero. Fun fact, Aegis is a Greek word for shield, if you didn't know. However, the real star amongst the supernovas were Eustace Kid, Trafalgar Law, and Killer. Especially Killer. Arguably, he shined more as a character than his own captain, I would say. Of course, we got to see the law that we were all accustomed to, crafting plans only to get aggravated with Luffy causing them to completely implode. And we got to see Kit and Luffy's headstrong personalities clash in a contest for the most stubborn pirate on the island. The trio that first joined forces on Saba Ori Archipelago, even if only briefly, finally took on the mighty Yonko, and we got to see Law and Kit tag team the nigh unstoppable Big Mom. Killer though was a real threat. He tragically eats a smile in order to save his captain. His turn as Kamazo, assassin for Orochi, landing some wild moves on Kaido during Roof Peace, and his clever strategy for defeating Basil Hawkins, Killer was a real pleasure to get to know this arc. Pun not intended. Even Karibu helped a little bit by giving Luffy all of his swamp meat. Actually, any other phrasing than that would be better. The meat that was inside of his swamp? And of course, we have the major players of Wano who are invested in the major conflict. Starting with the supporters of Wano, we have a large cast of stand-up figures. There's Hyogoro who stepped in for Rayleigh and gave Luffy the training montage that he needed in order to fight one-on-one -on -one with a Yonko. And who could of course forget Otama, the first person who Luffy meets in Wano Kuni and an emotional focal point especially in the early part of the arc. Not only does this future bewitching Kunoichi give us a host of animal friends like the Kuma Inu and, well, Speed, she ends up turning the tide of the raid with the most convenient devil fruit ever for combating an army of zone users. Tama is truly a fantastic character. Not only is she adorable, she was literally the raid saving grace. She's the first of two characters connected to Ace and she's emblematic of a central theme here, hunger. And so on multiple levels, she gives Wano more personal stakes for Luffy as he fights against Kaido. In many ways, with her wanting to travel to sea when she's older, she's just like Luffy when he was a kid too, with Ace and Luffy acting as her shanks. Another emotional center of the arc is Shimotsuke Yasuie, the former daimyo of Ringo. Now his relationship with the citizens of Ebisu Town, particularly his adopted daughter Toko, as well as his misadventures with Zoro during Act 2, are a true highlight of the arc. His heroic sacrifice in order to rescue the raid's chances make him one of the most memorable characters of Wano by far. Among the most powerful allies from Wano on the other side of the Samurai Ming Pirate Alliance are of course the Nine Scabbards, Odin's own retainers. All of these characters stand out in our fully developed personalities, especially Kinemon who's been with the crew for most of One Piece post time skip. Nekomamushi, Inorashi, Raizo, Kiku, Izo Kawamatsu, Ashura Doji, Denjiro, and Kinemon. And let's not forget the bonus member, Shinobu. And even though during the arc it didn't feel like it, they really had a lot of memorable moments, like collecting all their allies, like in the Akira Kurosawa film, one of Oda's major influences for the arc, their momentous battle against Kaido, the epic Tsunachi moment, another seven samurai knot in seeing the grave markers of the scabbards who didn't survive. I mean, this group, practically a second and crew shined throughout the Wano arc as they fought to uphold the Kazuki legacy. And really, all their stories flow a lot better with a second reread. There are a few other notable allies on the side of the Lions who are not from Wano themselves, however. Most notable was Marco the Phoenix, recruited by Nekomamushi to join into the battle. He had a legendary moment when he knocked Big Mom's crew off the waterfall. The second time, still no word what happened to that crew either. He also held off two Yonko commanders simultaneously and made sure that Zoro made it in time for Roof Peace. The Minks were also a crucial part part of the team. You couldn't have a Samurai Mink Ninja Pirate Alliance without them. Primarily, Carrot and Wanda featured heavily in their match against Perospero. Carrot, despite getting the loss here, ended up with the crown of Zoe. So since she apparently didn't get to become a Nakama, at least she got that going for her, which is nice. And of course, we have the Kozuki clan themselves, Kozuki Sukiyaki in the disguise of Tenguyama Hitetsu, who has gone into a life of hermitage after Orochi's takeover. Kozuki Hiyori, forced to live in disguise for decades as the courtesan Kumurazaki, waiting for her opportunity to end Orochi's wrath. Kozuki Toki, a time traveler from the Void Century, who we'd better learn more about soon. And one of the highlight characters of the arc 
work. And really, after all this, One Piece overall, I think, Momonosuke. He's just a scared little kid, but in this arc, he had to grow up fast, literally, to carry on the legacy of his father and to protect his country. Our sniveling, scared little Momo became worthy of the title of Shogun, a dragon that would actually protect the country instead of destroying it. And of course, one of the greatest allies to the Alliance was Odin himself. Now, we didn't learn that this character even existed until we were already at the raid on Onigashima, but they quickly became a fan favorite and a candidate for the next straw hat, Kaido's son, Odin, also known as as Yamato. Now, Yamato was a powerful force in the story from their first introduction, and one of my immediate favorite characters of the entire arc, proudly declaring to Luffy that they would be joining the crew. With the help of Odin's logbook and the backstory with Ace, this character brought on huge story revelations and immediately became a fan favorite. Not to mention that Yamato went toe to toe with Kaido through the use of their awesome Okuchino Makami Mythical Zone dog fruit. And in the end, for some reason, they didn't sail away with the Straw Hats, so we can only hope that they and our other favorite Yonko-san Katakuri join the Straw Hats under the banner of the Grand Fleet someday, but we're gonna have to get back to this development later. Finally though, we have the original Kozuki Odin as well. Former Shogun of Wano, crewmate to Roger and Whitebeard, a witness to the One Piece and all around the Giga Chad of One Piece. Odin would do anything for his crew and his country, up to and including being boiled alive and taking it in stride. Villains. Well, first of all, if you're not subscribed after watching this far, you are the real villain here. But so are the incredibly powerful antagonists of the Wano arc. The Straw Hats and all their allies actually managed to take down not one, but two of the fearsome emperors of the sea and Orochi. Kaido's crew had a ton of combatants for the Alliance to go up against. The Tobi Robo stood out as having some supremely interesting characters, though I felt like they were not developed as much as they could have been. We had met Page One back in Act One, but we also got a battle between two absolute tanks with Sasaki versus Frankie. The headstrong ulti made for a dynamic and entertaining character and a terrifying threat for Nami and Usopp. Black Maria gave us a wonderful Sanji moment, as well as the Robin fight that we've been waiting for all our lives. And the XCP9 agent who's who gave us the first whispers of the sun god Nika, setting up for Luffy's big Gear 5 reveal. And speaking of cypher pole agents, CP0 served as a real wild card during the entire raid on Onigashima. Their pursuit of Nico Robin and the interference in Kaido and Luffy's fight made for huge moments of tension and twists in the story overall, I'd say. Now, they weren't the only representatives of the world government to show up in Wano, though, because in the final final chapters, we also finally got the reveal of Aramaki, aka the new Navy Admiral Greenbull. His forest Logia Devil Fruit devastated the remnants of Kaido's crew and could have dealt the same blow to the scabbards if it weren't for Shanks' interference. The real star of Kaido's crew were the All-Stars. Jack had his moments on Zoe and unfortunately was sidelined during most of this arc. But Queen and King were fantastic characters here. Queen, who provided a lot of comic relief and his funky disposition brightened the Udon prison section of Act 2, and his personal connections to Judge Vince Smoke gave personal stakes to Sanji's fight against him. King's identity and backstory as a Lunarian raised a whole new host of mysteries and theories for the future of the series. And of course, Oda treated us to some truly amazing lessons in biology with the bizarre ancient Zone powers. On Orochi's side of things, Kanjuro's betrayal of the Nine Scabbards was wonderfully executed, even if many of the community had already correctly predicted that he was gonna be the traitor. Kanjuro also kidnapped Momo, adding to the tension of the raid and left the rest of Odin's retainers in a state of complete emotional disarray. For me personally, this is kind of up here with Squirt attacking Whitebeard as one of the greatest betrayals in all of One Piece so far. And of course, we have Kanjuro's master, the sniveling Orochi himself. He was something of a spandam to Kaido's Rob Lucci here. And much like spandam resurfacing as a part of ZP0, Orochi just 
wouldn't die. But at least the good part of his eight-headed devil fruit is that we got to see him be decapitated so many times. I mean, I can't even begin to count them. After all, one death just wouldn't have been enough for this despicable character. And finally, we had the two Yonko themselves, Big Mom and Kaido. Big Mom already had her time to shine on Whole Cake Island and certainly had some ups and downs here as well. I mean, there really weren't too many fans of the Amnesia subplot, for instance, including me. However, when it was finally time for Roof Peace and the battle against Kid and Law, she really showed exactly why she holds the fearsome title of Yonko. She also, of course, brought along her eldest son, Perospero, who did a lot of his usual licking and being a general creep, I guess. I mean, he did manage to have some really interesting clashes with Carrot, Wanda, and even Marco briefly. However, in the end, he was no match for a vengeful Neko Mamushi. Kaido, of course, was the leading villain of the arc. Absolutely fearsome in his power, a looming, unstoppable dragon and force of nature here. He wanted to crush Wano and plunge the world into war. In many ways, his character remains mysterious up to today because we know from his introduction that he has a death wish, he jumps off Sky Islands for fun, he's an alcoholic, often spilling into clumsy and excessive displays of emotion, but it's all very superficial really. He prizes strength above all else, he allows his underlings to challenge each other to climb up the food chain and become all-stars, and he also believes in a fair fight, interestingly enough. The scar that he received from Odin on his chest haunts him, knowing that he didn't win the fight fairly due to interference from the Kurozumi clan. Which is nice foreshadowing for that exact same type of interference in the fight with Luffy that leads him to showing no mercy to the ZP0 agent who interrupted them. But really, so far what we've gotten, his backstory felt fairly standard compared to, for example, the tragedy of Big Moms. So we can really only hope that when we learn more about Rox de Zebek, we get to learn more about Kaido and his true motives as well. The only question is, isn't it kind of too late at that point? And lastly, we of course have the Straw Hats. In an arc so saturated with characters, many didn't exactly get a ton of time to shine. On a second reread, in particular, Usopp didn't have a lot of big moments at all, but I hope that this will change in Elbath. Brook 2 plays more of a support role the entire arc after being the MVP of Whole Cake Islands. However, here are some of the highlights the Straw Hats gave us. Jinbei finally officially joined the crew and gave his racist opponent the smackdown that all racists deserve. Chopper did what Chopper does best, doctoring against the Ice Oni Plagues, but also thanks to his Rumble Ball fueled match against Queen, we were also treated to Baby Jeezer Chopper. Though his Rumble Balls, I kind of would have wished, would play more of a role in an arc filled with zone types. And let's not forget that Frankie ran over a Yonko's face with his motorcycle. Legendary. Nami finally got her Luffy will be Pirate King moment, as well as becoming a surrogate mother to Tama. Robin got a fantastic new power up and showed the fandom once and for all that she's a force to be reckoned with. Sanji unpacked a ton of family trauma finally here and got some super new bones. Zoro literally conquered the Grim Reaper, got Conqueror's Haki and received a new sweet sword but we learned surprisingly little about his heritage after it was strongly hinted that he had some sort of connections to the Shimotskis, which is disappointing. And Luffy? Well, Luffy became a Yonko. He became Joy Boy. He unlocked Ryo, advanced Conqueror's Haki, and Gear 5th. He took down Kaido and is now one of the strongest powers in all of One Piece. And Luffy's growth as a leader in this arc brings us to part 3, the themes of Wano. Now Wano, like so many One Piece arcs before it, is a story that has something to say, it has a really strong core message. In fact, it has a whole lot to say. Now that we've talked about the setting and the characters, it's really time to explore the themes that Wano Kuni has to offer. Because on a first read through, especially reading the story week, it's really hard to see what Oda is building towards. We're so invested in the moment-to-moment -moment action, the constant twists and turns, that it's hard to see the forest for the trees. And I'm not talking about the forest Logia that he was building to, though it was nice to finally meet Aramaki. Now, I'm talking about the messages that Oda is deliberately putting into the story and wants you to carry with you. Now, some of these are themes that we're already familiar with that you already know from One Piece, but in a remixed and new and interesting way. And some of 
the themes were completely new and unique to this arc. But backing up and looking at Wano all at once, the impact of the story is felt on a whole new level. Let's start with a really familiar one. The concept of inherited will shows up in almost every arc of the story. The Red Scabbards and especially Momonosuke inherited the will of Odin. Momo always sought to be strong like his father, to be the shogun that the country needed, but he's always been overcome by his fear. Fear of heights, of Kaido, of letting his own people down who depend on him. However, when Kaido chained him to a cross and gave him the opportunity to renounce his family name, Momo stood on solid grounds and wore the banner of the Kozuki proudly. Later in the arc, he realized just how important he was due to Yamato giving him his father's logbook. He learned that for some reason, crucial to the coming of the dawn, he has to remain alive. Then, thanks to Shinobu's powers, he literally grew up and became the adult that Wano needed. He overcomes his fear of using his dragon form and flying to help Luffy in the fight against Kaido. If you can call what he does overcoming his fear. However, like Luffy says, Momo has nothing to be scared of after biting an actual Yonko. Heck, Momo even learns how to use his flame clouds to save the flower capital from being crushed under the falling island Onigashima. And there's of course the entire thing of Luffy and Joy Boy here as well. Another recurring theme is the sins of the father. Characters like Ace, the son of the Pirate King, had to deal with the burdens of being born into notoriety. Of a world having it out for him just because of his parentage. In different ways, Robin, Frankie and Chopper also had to come to learn that it's not a sin to exist. In this arc, next to Momo, Sanji came to better terms with his Vinsmoke heritage. As his new powers awakened, he feared becoming an emotionless monster like his brothers, but instead he realized that just because he was born a Vinsmoke doesn't mean he can't be completely his own person. Orochi and Kanjiro represent another side to this theme. Their clan, the Kurozumi, were prosecuted for the sin of one of their forebearers. And through them, we see how destructive a cycle of hatred and revenge can actually become. It can swallow an entire nation. Without something to break that cycle, the hearts of the Kurozumi were consumed by revenge, and like their namesake, they burnt. Another very often reoccurring motive that appeared in Wano a lot was the theme of imprisonment. Now, throughout One Piece, prison has always been a feature of several arcs. What better to contrast against the the story's central theme of freedom, am I right? In Alabasta, the crew was imprisoned by Crocodile. In Ennis Lobby, Robin was held captive. Impel Down was a whole prison break arc in itself. Slavery is a central theme of Saba Odi Archipelago, Amazon Lily, and Fishman Island. On Hulk Kick Island, Luffy and Nami were imprisoned by Mondor. And really, this isn't even close to being every example we have in the story for this. Once again, imprisonment features heavily here, notably with the Udon Prison Mind plot, where Luffy and Kid spent a large portion of Act 2. And Yamato's character also suffers a very similar fate, being outfitted with explosive shackles and sentenced to remain on Onigashima their entire life instead of voyaging out to the sea. And as mentioned before, Momo's stint in captivity after being kidnapped by Kanjuro is also another very strong example of this. I mean, heck, in a sense, all the people of Wano are held captive, subjugated by the oppressive rule of Orochi and the Beast Pirates. Thankfully though, they had a warrior of liberation to set them free. Then there is the theme of leadership, particularly the question of what it means to be a good leader. Luffy Luffy and Odin, while both bombastic characters with some headstrong similarities, are heavily contrasted against one another here. Odin's leadership style was to work endlessly for his country and his followers. He wanted to support everyone and do it independently. Even in his final moments, he holds them up so that they don't have to burn with him. Now, in the end, of course, everyone does count on Luffy defeating Kaido, but Luffy counts on his crew and allies to help him accomplish this just in the same way. Along the way to the rooftop to confront Kaido, the full force of the Beast Pirates try to prevent him from ascending Onigashima, but each time he's able to count on some ally to take on the foes in his way. Kaido, on the other hand, of course, has a very different take on what it means to be a leader. And it's another central theme of the arc, survival of the fittest. A philosophy of might makes right. Kaido's crew is made up largely of former captains who he beat into submission, 
whose will he literally broke. Unlike Luffy, who tries to empower those around him to accomplish their individual dreams and reach their full potential, Kaido just drags everyone weaker than him along in service of his own desires and plans. Everything about his crew reflects the idea of a hierarchy purely based on strength and power. The roles on his crew are all named after playing cards. The numbers, Jack, Queen, King, all in ascending order of strength. The Flying Six are allowed to challenge the All-Stars in combat in order to claim spots for themselves here. They are the Beast Pirates, the Animal King Pirates. They're primal and prehistoric. In their days, the dinosaurs were the peak of the food chain. Everything else was beneath them. Though maybe they are also meant to be relics of a bygone era. I mean, Oda giving them all ancient Zoans could also represent an idea that their philosophy of survival of the fittest is outdated, to be replaced by values that the Straw Hats represent much, much better, such as liberty and equality. After all, the Beast Pirates did include Who's Who, an outspoken racist against fishmen whose views belong in the distant past as our heroes usher in a new dawn of the world. And speaking of Who's Who, while he's a terrible person, he's an excellent bridge to our next theme, identity. Who's Who is just one of many, many, many characters in Wano to have some sort of hidden or secret identity. This mask member of the Toby Ropo was in reality a former member of CP9, who after failing to guard the Nika fruit from Shanks, was thrown into prison. After his escape, he started a new life in hiding with the Beast Pirates. Another member of Kaido's crew with a notable hidden identity is King. Underneath a whole lot of kinky looking leather, he hides the last Lunarian, also an escapee from the world government, much like Who's Who and his captain. Kanjiro too hid his identity as a Kurozumi from the rest of the Scabbards. Even even Big Mom lost her identity and sense of self during the amnesia subplot. In Odin's flashback, Kurozumi Higurashi uses the Mane Mane no Mi, a fruit whose whole purpose is to assume other people's identities. On the Alliance side of things, we have Tenguyama Hitetsu, who was secretly Kozuki Sukiyaki. He hid himself away partly out of necessity for survival, but also out of shame for his failure to allow Wano to become what it did. We have Killer becoming Kamazo, extra membership in S.W.O.R.D. and Yasuiya's experience as the witching hour boy. Yeah, remember when that was a thing? And even Onimaru transforms into Gyukimaru, this like monk-like yokai figure. In the beginning of the arc, we see the Straw Hats assuming new identities while in hiding, with names like Luffy Taru and Zoro Judo, though it's no wonder that they were found out almost immediately when you really think about it. However, a lot of Sanji's role in this arc revolves around him hiding his identity as Soba Mask or by using his invisibility, but ends with him claiming proudly who he knows he is. Momonosuke too refuses to hide his identity when he had the chance. And one of the clearest explorations of identity in the Wano arc comes from Yamato, as controversial as it might be. Yamato sees Odin as a hero to the extent that they've claimed his identity as their own. The most glaring and obvious theme throughout Wano, however, is that of hunger. Luffy and co had literally just left Whole Cake Island, an entire island themed around edible stuff and food, which served as a clear contrast moving from an island overflowing with sweets to a barren wasteland where the citizens are all starving to death. After Luffy saves Tama from some lower level beast pirates, she feeds him a serving of rice as a thank you. It is then that Hitetsu reveals that this rice was the most food that she'd got to have all year, which is just the sweetest and most heartbreaking moment all at once. To drench her hunger, she drinks from the poisoned river, leading us to the Bakura and Okobore town parts of Act 1. The elites in Bakura town hoard food from their private farm while everyone else is starving. But after Luffy gives a beating to the sumo wrestler Yokozuna, and hold them, they steal the treasure barge loaded with food and give Leftovers Town a feast that they will never forget. Luffy even declares this early on in the arc that he'll turn Wano into a place where you can eat as much as you want every single day. Tama receives delicious Ushiruku from Tsuru, making it all the more meaningful when the same dish causes one of Big Mom's hunger pains when she has amnesia, as well as igniting Luffy's rage when the Beast Pirates waste huge serving of it during the Fire Festival. The smile fruits also align nicely with the theme of hunger as well. 
Orochi cruelly feeds the defective fruits to the citizens of Ibisu Town so that they will be cursed to always laugh despite living in complete despair. Killer 2 meets this fate as well. What began as a peculiar trait of Kaido's pleasures had one of the darkest twists in all of One Piece in the end. Now thankfully that Wano has finally been saved, it really has become a place where the residents can eat as much as they want every single day, especially thanks to Green Bull's kind of replenishing of the entire countryside. But it's now time to really talk about what Wano did very right and where it really fell short of everyone's expectations in part 4, the highs and lows of the story. <clears throat> now look, I know that in spite of much much fan speculation also my end, we didn't get a 5 act structure in Wano. The theory community in particular earned a PhD in Kabuki theater studies early on in the arc before we learned that we just get a really really incredibly long act. Act 3. However, to appease the fanbase's desire for a 5 act structure, I'm happy to inform you that we will have 5 acts to our Wano analysis. So what made Wano such a controversial arc? What made some fans love it unconditionally and others basically threaten to quit the entire story? I mean simply by its length alone, Wano was bound to be an arc of high highs and low lows. It had some of the hypest moments of the entire series to date hands down, but it also had moments that really disappointed me and fans, things that made us question Oda's judgement at times and things that made us pray that we'll just revisit Wano before the end of the series to get some closure on a bunch of things. It is one of the most divisive arcs in the series, with many online saying that it's hands down the best arc and others making the bold statement that it's the worst arc, which I wouldn't go that far. Let's start by looking at the lowest lows of this arc. And we can't really talk about the lows without talking about the lowest of the all stars, Jack. After so we saw Jack as this terrifying presence. He was the first billion plus berry bounty that we saw in the series, he terrorized the minks on Zo, but thanks to Sunisha, he never got to actually take on the Straw Hats. And so understandably, in Wano, many people were really excited to see Jack in action again, but he was absolutely steamrolled. First he was easily defeated by Ashura Doji, then during the raid he was essentially off screen by Sulong Inuarashi and Ekomamushi. And I feel like after we'd seen them and the other Ming suffer so much at his hands, it would have been nice to get a few more panels at least to get some closure on that entire storyline. Oh boy, okay, um, Amnesia. Just like Sabo before her, Big Mom got Amnesia during this arc and the fanbase was not happy about it. There were a few highlights to the segment of the story, some gags with her befriending Chopper and acting as a mother figure to Tama that were honestly amusing and I did enjoy those, however Amnesia does feel like a bit of a lazy and contrived plot device very quickly and in this case it didn't quite justify itself I would say. Oh yeah, and coming into Wano we all thought that this was going to be Zoro's arc in the same way that Whole Cake Island was Sanji's arc. This turned out to be not the case. He had a fair share of wonderful moments like slashing a building in half at the beginning, receiving Enma and his amazing feats during Roof Peace. However, during Whole Kick Island we learned a whole lot more about Sanji's backstory and got a great deal of character development for him as well. Zoro wasn't really developed in the same way here, even though there were some hints dropped that he does have some sort of close connection to Wano, specifically to the four former daimyo of Ringo. So it's surprising especially that Zoro didn't visit Ryuma's grave at all, like that was something I was 100% expecting to happen. Really the only thing was we had a few characters commenting on the significance of Shusui, even claiming that Zoro must be a grave robber for having it in his possession. However, having first learned about Wano Country through Ryuma during the Thriller Bark arc and Ryuma being connected to Oda's original one-shot manga Wanted, many thought that we'd learn more about this ancient ancient warrior or at least see Zoro pay his respects to him. And really, it wasn't only Zoro that got the short end of the stick here. Most of the Straw Hats didn't have a ton to do except Luffy of course. We had an incredibly inflated cast of characters to juggle around here, particularly with the Nine Scabbards acting as major players in this arc since we had to meet and develop every single one of them. It also meant less time for the Straw Hats, which was a bit disappointing. Because with the attention being split here, it meant that not only the Straw Heads, but also the Nine Scabbards were not as well fleshed out as they could have been. Characters like Carrot especially, who's sailed with our crew for multiple arcs in a row now, did basically nothing besides eating grass I guess. Oh yeah, 
<laughs> and uh, this is, of course, all of our favorite topic. This isn't a new criticism for One Piece, of course. Oda does not like to kill off characters. Characters survive the most impossible circumstances so often that even when a character does actually die, most of the fan base doesn't even believe it at first. I mean, take Kaido and Big Mom as an example. Now, there were some good deaths in this arc. Yasui is crucifixion, and all three of Orochi's deaths were all three great. The surprise decapitation by Kaido was especially cool. Orochi coming back multiple times makes sense giving his devil fruit, I mean, eight heads, eight lives, and it does fit with his character quite nicely as well. Just as he clings to Kaido for power, he clings to life. He's a pest that you just can't get rid of, so thematically quite well done. Kandro's art fruit does not play by the same rules. He also just keeps coming back to combat the scabbards. Even after multiple death scenes, he becomes a strange fire monster, seemingly out of nowhere and unrelated completely to his devil fruit powers. And of course, the jury is still kind of out whether Kaido and Big Mom are actually dead. I mean, in most series, getting shot through the earth straight into freaking mock would be a certain death sentence, but we've seen just how durable these Yonko are. So I'll only believe it when I get an obituary straight from Oda himself. Now, where deaths really become a problem in this arc is with the red scabbards. In the end, two scabbards died during the raid. Ashura Doji, who sacrificed himself to save the group from an explosion, and Izo, who died fighting ZP0. Coincidentally, these also happen to be the two scabbards with the least amount of characterization. We didn't spend nearly as much time with Ashura Doji as we did with the other scabbards like Raizo, Nekomamushio, Inorashi, or even Kiku, who we met right away in Act 1. And Izo didn't even meet up with the group until the raid started itself. We only had a few scenes from Marine Fort and a little bit of Odin's flashback to develop this character in particular. So even though tragic and nice characters, these deaths didn't really hit hard at all, to me personally at least. And so just to spell it out openly, Kinemon and Kiku should have died during the raid. Oda gave them amazing final moments, only to undo them chapters later by a technicality. I mean, Kinemon's split a body may have been lightly foreshadowed in Punk Hazard, but we've never seen this impact with anyone else Law has operated on. It did feel a little bit like an ass pull. You'd think that after three arcs of walking around with his torso loose, it would have fallen off with something a little bit lighter than a full force hit from Kaido. I mean, we have been traveling with Kinemon for all of the new worlds. Losing him would have been remembered as one of the big biggest emotional moment of the series, and instead it was reduced to a gag just a few chapters later. Really a wasted, perfect death scene right there. Could have been so good. Ah, and you know that this one was gonna come as well. On Whole Kick Island, Big Mom had a full two chapters dedicated to her backstory. And through these two chapters, she became a much more complex and interesting character than anyone would have ever imagined previously. Her background was tragic and twisted, and it helped define her as an antagonist and made us understand her so, so much better. Kaido, on the other hand, as far as we can tell, apparently is a strong guy who's good at war and loves to do war and wants to start war. He's always been that apparently. Given Oda the benefit of the doubt, it's probable that we're still gonna learn more about it with Rox de Zebek when we get that backstory, but perhaps the important bits of that story are too crucial to future mysteries for us to know right now at this point. But any way you cut it, this backstory was just a major letdown and a major disappointment. I mean, come on. Coming on the heels of not only Big Mom, but villains like Doflamingo, who had received excellent backstories and complex characterization, Kaido's backstory left so much to be desired, especially after it was hinted at that he was such a more interesting and complex character than he seemed on the surface. Really, it ended up being just a portion of a chapter, and that felt incredibly rushed and glossed over. Over. So much of Kaido's behavior and dialogue is enigmatic. His cryptic references to Joy Boy, for instance, super interesting, but for now we just don't know much about what makes this villain tick, which you kind of need if you want like an impact when he's defeated. Up until the backstory, he had the potential to be remembered as the greatest One Piece villain the series has seen so far, but it still feels like he's missing a few essential pieces, really. So that was maybe, personally for me, the biggest letdown 
breakdown of the entire arc. Or so I thought, but there is actually this, I forgot. Uh, one of the major reasons some fans look back on Wano with whatever the opposite of rose-colored glasses are, is that the very last chapter of the arc left a lot of readers on a real, real low note. And that's of course Yamato. Now, from their very first introduction, Yamato declared that they wanted to join the crew. We had every indication that it was Yamato's goal to join the future Pirate King at sea, following in the footsteps of Odin. They said so 10 times minimum, it feels. I mean, this notion was constantly reinforced and repeated right up until the very last moment. Moment. And then, out of nowhere, in the very last chapters of the arc, Yamato just stated that they had changed their mind and would now stay to do sightseeing in Wano. They even said they'd already talked to Luffy about it, an important conversation that was just off-screened and ended up making the reveal incredibly jarring to follow. Now, even though it's tragic and I'm very disappointed with it, the problem isn't really that Yamato didn't join the crew. It's more that the rug was pulled out from us with such force and with no warning, it just doesn't feel like Oda the master of foreshadowing, really foreshadowing this particular twist. It's not really similar to a situation like Polly, where during the Water 7 arc it felt like he might become the crew's shipwright before Frankie reveals himself as the true candidate. That was some sort of misdirection, but it had plenty of lead up throughout the arc and the progression felt really, really natural. The, the entire thing here with Yamato just, this here just felt like it came out of nowhere, like Oda went, oh, actually, I don't want to bring Yamato along, and so it really left a lot of Yamato Yamato fans, including me, feeling like they've been slapped in the face. Now, to be fair, a few chapters later we would at least receive a better excuse for Yamato's change of mind. I mean, Yamato staying in order to protect Wano from outside threat makes sense in comparison to just wanting to explore the various regions of the country. I mean, after all, the Okuchi no Makami, Yamato's mythical zone fruit, is a guardian deity of Wano. However, that doesn't change the fact how the entire thing was handled, especially after all that setup and the fact that a lot of fans were outraged by that sudden twist. Now, when you lay them all out like that, it does feel like Wano had a lot of negatives. And that's true. There are some actual major downsides that detract from an arc that was a real contender for the best One Piece arc ever. However, I want to make the case that there were even more positives here to look at. Just as the lows in Wano were really low, the highs were also incredibly high. So let's look at the most high moments and the biggest highs in the entire arc. The first highlight we'll go over comes towards the tail end of Act 1. For years we'd been a little bit confused about Momonosuke, a little kid somehow commenting that he knew Goldie Roger, who had died 20 years prior to this. Some eagle-eyed fans figured out the time travel twist, but many casual fans were really shocked to learn that some of the scabbards had been sent forward in time by a character called Toki. Now, Similar to Amnesia, time travel is a very risky and difficult trope to pull off as well. I mean, we already talked about how the Big Mom Amnesia surplot was not received well at all, and weaving time travel into an already complicated plot could have been disastrous, let's be real. I mean, you well know that time travel has a way of completely unraveling stories and creating a lot of paradoxes that make it really hard to enjoy the rest of the story. Luckily, however, Oda sticking to his rule of time travel only happened in one direction helped him avoid the problems with this particular plot device. The method he used to reveal it, ending a chapter with Luffy finding the grace of his comrades, was an excellent way to frame that entire twist, I think. Also, learning that Kinemon, Momo and the others were lost in time added new meaning to their journey so far as well. Every encounter with them gained new meaning as we found out they weren't only adrift in foreign lands, but literally out of place in time as they went on their quest to recruit allies to take on Kaido. The next highlight comes directly after that reveal as well, with Kaido's Devil Fruit reveal and the first confrontation with Luffy. Honestly, the ending of of Act 1 was fire. Many had assumed correctly that Kaido possesses a dragon fruit, but there were a lot of different theories floating around the community before we finally got that actual reveal. However, seeing Kaido's gargantuan dragon form descend from the clouds of Awano was really something else entirely, also in the anime I want to say. Whether you saw that one coming or not, chances are you were awestruck and intimidated by this beast's true appearance. It was really something else. Well done. Then leave it to 
Oda to completely subvert our expectations as usual by showing us this massive monster be absolutely plastered. Luffy wasted no time in trying to take on the huge Yonko, but even his strongest strikes could hardly face Kaido. Oda raised the stakes once again by having Kaido evidently destroy the Straw Hats and the Heart Pirates with a blast breath aimed straight at the remains of Odin's castle. After Luffy had spent the last arcs getting stronger and stronger, eking out victories against Doflamingo and Katakuri, we realized just how much further he still had to go when he was literally one shot by a Thunder Bagua. Luffy did have one feat of his own though, showing that his spirit would not break. He managed to activate Conqueror's Hockey while being unconscious. <laughs> of course, leave it to someone like Luffy and Kid to be so headstrong that they turn torture into a training montage. I mean, using the Sea Stone Cuffs as Rock Lee style training weights, that is badass. It really goes to show just how willful the supernovas are going through all that training while being constantly sapped of their energy. I mean, Luffy even got a whole new muscle-bound makeover. Hyogoro taking over as Luffy's temporary mentor in the prison mines was a highlight of Act 2 for me as well. We finally learned the secret of Ryo or advanced armament hockey and received answers to a whole lot of mysteries. For instance, we learned the secret behind Rayleigh being able to remove exploding cuffs. We also found out why the Yonko are so seemingly invincible and how to actually penetrate their defenses. And I mean, why buy a punching bag to practice on when you have a perfectly good Big Mom right there? Good stuff. Okay, now this is how you do a death scene properly. We didn't know Yasuo before this arc. When we met him, he was a silly gag character, tagging along with an irritating Zoro. And in perfect Oda fashion, he disarmed us with comedy before hitting us right in the fields. We slowly started to learn about his relationship with Toko. We learned of his connection to Ebisu Town. We learned that he was the witching hour boy who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. And eventually we learned that this goofy character was a proud and stern former daimyo of Wano. And after he tragically sacrificed himself so that the raid on Onigashima could still maintain the element of surprise, the citizens of Ebisu Town gathered in the flower capital, laughing uncontrollably. What a sad and tragic moment. We learned the depth of the torture that Orochi had inflicted on Wano when we found out the terrible curse brought on by the Smile Devil Fruits. And so Shimotsuke Yasuie, a maybe relative of Zoro himself, earned his place as one of the true MVPs of Wano. A fantastic and really heartbreaking moment. Okay, so it's a little bit unreal to think that we saw Roger reach Laugh Tail for the first time during the Wano arc. I mean, we learned that the island was even called Laugh Tail and not Raftel during the Wano arc as well. We saw Roger and Whitebeard clashing in their prime. We saw Roger's journey around the world to all the different Poneglyphs, many in places that the Straw Hats have been on their journey to as well. We saw Young Shanks, Young Buggy and Blackbeard and of course Whitebeard. And of course we saw Kozuki Odin. His chaotic youth spent drinking and gambling, his disownment and subsequent appointment as daimyo, his reformation of the lawless land of Kuri, the gathering of his retainers, his adventures out at sea and family life with Toki, Hiyori and Momonosuke. And most importantly, to the central conflict of Wano, his relationship with Orochi and Kaido. He was the only person so far to scar the monstrous dragon, a part of Kaido's and Odin's shared backstory that did deliver characterization for the villain that his own backstory did not, as we've discussed. We we had one of the most intense and crazy feats in all of One Piece and an explanation for Odin's absurd hairstyle when he held his retainers above him while boiling in oil. Odin was indeed born to boil and this was one of the most memorable moments in all of One Piece I'd say. Now after the Odin flashback, it was time for things to get real. The Red Scabbards, remembering the legacy of their master, faced down Onigashima. Due to Kinemon's hilarious misunderstanding about the new meeting place and time, it looked as if the plan had had been foiled. They would face Kaido alone. The striking panel of them framed against the raging sea is one of the best in all of Wano. And as if things couldn't get any worse, they were met with the ultimate betrayal. Not only did Kandro lie about his allegiances, he lied about his art skills and fled with Momo and Tao. You could really feel the rest of the Scabbard's utter despair as their friend and comrade for years betrayed them. Shortly after, Kandro
Alejandro's betrayal, things took a much more hopeful turn as the Alliance finally assembled. With the return of Jimbei, the complete Straw Hat crew was officially assembled for the first time in the series. Again, a wonderful and epic moment. Hoda wasted no time giving us some panel to die for. After so many arcs of our crew being split up, seeing them back together again made the raid on Onigashima feel like pre-Timeskip One Piece in a lot of ways. After focusing so much on an ever-expanding cast of new characters, it brought us back to the central course of the manga that is the Straw Hat crew. Now, Yamato might not have become a Straw Hat, but they were an immediate highlight of the arc, for me at least. Just like Katakuri in Whole Kick Island, the fan favorite character of Act 3 was a powerful son of a Yonko who befriended Luffy. Yamato has an amazing, merch worthy design, a wild attitude, gave us some much loved ace backstory, and was a bigger Odin fanboy than any One Piece fan could ever be. Really, here's to praying that we'll get to see this character soon again, some point in the story. What a moment this was. I mean, the Red Scabbard's fight against Kaido ended in complete failure. Really, they couldn't do much of anything to the Yonko, but they made one hell of a first strike in which they all worked together in unison to rush the main stage and stab the scar that their master Odin had left behind. Remembering the only man who was powerful enough to scar him, Kaido was shook. His regrets surrounding his unfinished and dishonorable fight led him to clutching his own wound in disbelief, momentarily causing the unstoppable beast to pause. In unison, they gave the battle cry of Kuri, Sunachi. In the end, predictably, the scabbards were defeated, but they put forth a valiant effort. Now, Roof Peace is where things really kicked off here. In Chapter 1000, a monumental milestone for One Piece, Luffy flexed harder than he's ever flexed by straight up casually walking past Kaido and Big Mom to check on the bloody and battered scabbards. Five members of the worst generation went head to head with two of the most powerful characters in all of One Piece. And while at first their efforts seemed fruitless, eventually they were able to earn their victory truly showing that a new age of piracy has dawned. And while the entire Zoro kills Kaido theory train was stopped hard in its tracks here, Zoro fans were still eating quite well, as the swordsmen managed to temporarily block a combined attack from two emperors of the sea. Not only that, but Zoro actually managed to cut Kaido, the first person since Odin to do so. Now, there were a lot of really amazing and memorable fights during the raid. The amount of one versus ones we got hacking back to the good old days of Enna's lobby, when the Straw had faced off in matchups against the CP9. Jinbei got his first fight as a member of the crew, finally. Zoro and Sanji even had a couple of chapters of a duo match against King and Queen, and seeing these two actually team up momentarily is always a treat. However, let's be real, the standout among these matchups was Robin versus Black Maria. Nico Robin has always been a strong character. The Devil Fruit, despite its drawbacks, is so, so versatile. From day one as a member of Baroque Works, she was breaking backs left and right. But not since Skypiea has she gotten to use her skills in a real battle, only in momentary glimpses, like when she managed to stop Hakuba, who possessed Cavendish in Dressrosa. Now, after seeing Robin rescue Sanji from Black Maria's spidery crutches, we were able to see Robin's full power on display here for the first time since the time skip. There was a moment when we thought Black Maria's illusions might have tricked her with visions of Clover and Olivia. However, Robin is too smart to be deceived with petty tricks like that. Robin even received a nightmarish transformation, the demonial flirt that gloved Black Maria the clutch to end all the clutches. Let's really hope we get even more Robin's fight going forward to make up for lost time, and while we're at it, a Brook 1 vs 1 wouldn't hurt either Oda. And of course, it wouldn't be One Piece without some top tier comedy either. Some highlights were getting to see the full crew's NL reaction faces, Kinemon playing off the misunderstanding of the century as a masterful plan, Robin and Jinbei being the only adults on the crew, and Frankie running over Big Mom's face with a freaking motorcycle. And of course, the scientifically super accurate dinosaur powers such as Triceratops having a built-in propeller, and Brachiosauruses being able to launch themselves out of their own body. However, if you had me at gunpoint and told me to choose just one particular hilarious moment in the entire arc, I would just have to go with the Zaro pack. This is what happens when you have a chef playing the role of doctor. 
I mean, Trigun fans didn't waste any time comparing the cook to Wolfwood, who also carries a cross filled with particularly lethal contents. And yes, this arc, we learned that Luffy is, in fact, Joy Boy. And that rubber fruit he's had since childhood, since chapter number one, is a whole lot more than just a rubber fruit. It's the Hito Hitonomi model Nika, named for the sun god of the One Piece worlds. And Luffy only unlocked this devil fruit awakening after his own death. When he was brought back, he turned pure white, couldn't stop smiling and laughing, and his heartbeat pounded in a sound that Sunisha called the drums of liberation. In this form, Luffy wasn't the only thing that was rubber. He could turn the ground to rubber, he could turn a lightning bolt into rubber, and most importantly, he could turn Kaido into rubber as well. Who knows? Maybe he could even turn this pretty cute kitten into a rubber as well. Are you rubber? I don't think so. What's that? You want to run away because they haven't subscribed? That's fair enough. <laughs> now, Luffy in Gear 5 because. <laughs> Luffy in Gear 5 becomes a cartoon come to life, gaining the absurd power set of a Looney Tune. Whether it's his eyes jumping out of his head or contorting his body into all sorts of malleable shapes, it's clear that this awakening is a whole new level for Luffy, a power befitting the future King of the Pirates and one that we can't wait to see in action again soon. And even though the battle against Kaido had finally ended, Oda just couldn't have us leave Wano without one last major surprise. In an appearance presumably promoting his appearance in film Red, Shanks showed up in the final chapters of Wano and gave us the wildest hockey feat we've seen in the entire series. Shanks was able to knock a marine admiral Aramaki out of his low gear form and scare him away from the island with nothing but a show of conquerors hockey. As if this wasn't crazy enough, he did this from miles and miles away at sea. Somehow through this use of hockey he was even able to seemingly communicate a specific message to his opponent, something we've never considered possible before. Shanks's appearance set the stage for the final saga and showed us that the power ceiling is even higher than we previously thought. Which is just fan freaking tastic But then as you know, at that point we just suddenly leave Wano quite abruptly with uh, still a lot of unanswered questions. So in part 5 we have to talk about the remaining mysteries that are left unanswered in Wano. Even after revisiting the entire arc, plenty of questions remain unanswered. How will our perspective of this gargantuous arc evolve over the years, I wonder? Well, in the same way that Skypiea deniers have had to reckon with this arc's renewed importance recently, we will probably look back on Oda's decisions in Wano years down the line and shower them with newfound praise. At least, I hope so. So what are we still not seeing and what do we still need to know before we'll truly be able to fully comprehend and appreciate Wano? Throughout the Wano arc, we learned loads of information about the One Piece world. However, after this arc, we're still left with tons of mysteries. It wouldn't be Oda's writing if we didn't have two new questions for each answer that we got. So here are the biggest questions we still have for the final saga. At the end of this arc, we learned courtesy of Kozuki Sukiyaki that the ancient weapon Pluton rests deeply beneath Wano Kuni. And on an even more mind-blowing level, the massive walls around Wano were constructed to hide it in the first place. The opening Wano's borders we've heard so much about doesn't just refer to its isolation, but to freeing the ancient weapon itself. But the question still remains, what is Pluton? What is it capable of? And are Momonosuke and Zonisha somehow involved in a similar way to Shirahoshi and the Sea Kings? It's really unbelievable that in this arc we met a character who actually hails from the Void Century and it's barely a highlight at all. Now something tells me we still have a lot to learn about Toki, whether that means she's actually still alive somehow and propelled herself forward in time or when we learn more about the Void Century via flashback. As a member of the Kozuki clan, the original creators of the Poneglyphs, we still need more information on this mysterious woman from the past. Now as we've discussed in detail in the last section, Kaido's backstory is super incomplete. Major parts were seemingly just glossed over and the major speculation around this is that Oda had to admit certain important details to avoid revealing too much about Roxy Zebek. Hopefully, when we look back on the Wano arc, we'll see Kaido in a completely new light, just how we did with Big Mom after Whole Cake Islands. Why does he yearn for an honorable death? What caused his drinking problems? And why does he want to plunge the world into war? Oh, and how does he know so much about Joy Boy? And speaking of Kaido's backstory, we know next to nothing still about his people, the Oni race. 
The only confirmed member of this mysterious race are Kaido and Yamato, but there are plenty of other characters out there with horns, both on the Emperor's crew and in other places throughout the One Piece world that will raise our suspicions as well. What is the secret behind the Oni and more importantly, where have they gone? Were they like the Lunarians wiped out by the world government? Oh yeah, and uh, speaking of the Lunarians, we also need to learn about those as well. We learned a lot about the Lunarians during the fight with King. For instance, we now know that they exist. We also learned that they used to inhabit the Red Line. They have black wings and the ability to conjure fire, spawning, by the way, a million fan theories about Sanji being imbued with Lunarian DNA, or Luffy, who knows. The name also suggests that they hail from the moon, much like the other winged races probably do as well. We still need to know, though, why they were wiped out from the world government and what their role was in the past of the One Piece world. Now, we're about to get a lot more information about them with the new Seraphim Pacifista, who seem to be warlord clones spliced with Lunarian DNA. But I guess we'll have to wait and see how much is going to be actually revealed in the next arc. Now, it's kind of insane that we heard the name Rox for the very first time in this arc. Like, I kind of forgot that that's a thing. Ever since we heard the mysterious figure that united Big Mom, Kaido, Shiki, Whitebeard under one flag, the theory community has been hard at work trying to figure out who Rox Dizabak is. We need to know how he plays into Kaido's backstory, what happened at God Valley, and most importantly, just who he is in general. What is his connection to Blackbeard? And of course, we can't wait to find out more about Joy Boy and the Sun God Nika. I mean, sure, there's the question of how exactly the powers were brought into a devil fruit and inherited by Luffy. That's a question for Vegapunk, I guess. But we're more curious about who these characters were during the Void Century or before the Void Century even. Who was Joy Boy? Why did he apologize to the ruler of Fishman Island? What was his connection to Zonisha? And what was the terrible crime that Zonisha committed? And what is Joy Boy's connection to the sun god Nika? Are they the same person? Or is Nika truly a deity? Are they from the same time span? Like these answers and more are sure to come soon as we come closer and closer to the end of One Piece, but we didn't get them here in Wano yet. Just a lot of teasing. So it has really been a long four years. It was a long 148 chapters, but in the end, Wano was like any other One Piece arc. It had moments that made us laugh, moments that put us on the edge of our seats, moments that made us cry, and moments that had us absolutely lose our minds. It also had some very disappointing parts, especially for everyone who kind of had expectations for the story to go in a certain direction and were then kind of let down when Oda did what Oda does best and wrote something utterly unpredictable. I'm not an exception here at all. But in spending 100 hours in rereading this arc, I found one thing for certain. As controversial as this arc really is, possibly the most controversial in the series, Wano is One Piece. We like to praise Oda in our favorite series unconditionally. We look at arcs like Ennis Lobby and Marineford and hold them up on a pedestal as peak One Piece, but we can't forget the valleys that this series contain. A maligned arc like Fishman Island or Thriller Bark is just as much part of this modern epic as all those other arcs. And even within those arcs, each of them has a blend of good and bad stuff. There are plenty of fans with criticism of these much-loved arcs, and even the least popular arcs have a lot of highlights in them as well. Now, even though amongst the most epic moments in the series, there were some disappointments as well, even though it's controversial, love it or hate it, Wano is just as much part of the series that we love. Isn't that right, Gojo? And as Gojo said, there is a lot more to be said about it. Like, for example, all the crazy little details Tales hidden within Kaido's character arc, even though we didn't get that full backstory. If that sounds interesting to you, click this video right here.